I shall do so sort of yeah, cut dancing comedy Jojo Rabbit! Jojo Rabbit! Jojo Rabbit! Jojo Rabbit! Jojo Rabbit! Jojo Rabbit, a movie okay. that released in 2019 mostly critical acclaim. It's a satirical coming-of-age story about a kid who grew up in Nazi Germany. This movie received a lot of great reviews, and even an Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay, but it also received a good chunk of bad reviews, so it makes me wonder, is there something general audiences miss that makes this movie not all it's cracked up to be? Well, I don't think so. I really this movie. enjoy this movie, and I think there's a lot to appreciate about it, but don't let me make that decision for you. I'm going to go through the whole movie and talk about the things I think are good and the things I think are bad and then you can make okay. that decision for yourself I don't want to waste any more time though so let's just dive right in I mean, the film opens with Jojo time. talking to himself in the mirror hyping himself up about well, going to the Nazi is, camp. Uh, we get dialogue telling us that he's completely devoted to Hitler in Germany and this is where we get to see his imaginary friend Hitler and we're already to a point where I need to talk about something this movie stirred up a good bit of controversy when it was released which isn't at all surprising I mean it's a goofy movie about Nazis of course it's going to stir up controversy yeah. but it does something that I think is important. It shows the Nazis in a defanged light. It satirizes them in a way that makes them seem completely incompetent and downright stupid at times. I think this is a good thing because it doesn't give the people who don't understand satire something to look up to. Satire is an incredibly thin line to tread and I don't blame anyone who is put off by the Nazis portrayal in this movie. Obviously you're free to feel any way you want about this movie, but this movie's portrayal of the Nazis isn't about making light of a horrible event in history. It's about showing people of today that Nazis were stupid ignorant people who committed heinous yeah. atrocities for similarly stupid and ignorant reasons. The reason I think it was smart because to make them seem utterly ridiculous is because satire can sometimes backfire. Like in the case of the movie American History X, a movie that released in 1998 about uh, a Nazi uh, gang in Southern California. The film was intended to show just how brutally violent and disgusting these extremist ideals can be. And don't get me wrong, it does an excellent job at this. And I really do think it's an excellent it's film. Acting, the problem comes when you get people not that are under the sway of those ideas. Deals, they won't see Edward Norton's character as a disgusting monster. They see him as a hardcore badass that they can look up to and try to emulate. And this is where I think Jojo Rabbit succeeds, because it doesn't give anyone that opportunity. I can't imagine any neo-Nazi watching this movie and thinking that Hitler seems like a total badass. Bottom line is, though, whenever satire is really well done, there are always going to be people who either don't get it or don't appreciate it. And honestly, it's fine either way. You're free to feel about it however you will. I just think it's important to understand the intentions behind a work of art before criticizing it. After Jojo gets ready to leave and has sufficiently heiled Hitler. Ooh, that's it, you got it. Heil Hitler, have a great day. Heil Hitler, you're gonna be the best. Heil Hitler, you can do it. Heil Hitler. We see him running through the streets, Heil Hitler and what he sees, and we get these pieces of what seemed to be actual Nazi propaganda. And I'm glad they threw those clips in there because it shows us that people like Jojo really could have existed. It shows us that there really were people in Nazi Germany so enthralled and captivated by Hitler that they worshipped him. Possibly in the same way Jojo does. Now Jojo is at his okay, Hitler and we get an introduction to Sam Rockwell's character, Captain Klinzendorf, who was a soldier in the German army but lost one of his eyes and is now forced to run the camp. We immediately see that Klinzendorf yeah, is disenfranchised in Nazi Germany as he says that even though the country's on the back foot and there isn't much hope in winning the war, apparently we're doing just fine. We also find out that he's constantly drunk and he really doesn't care about doing his job well. We also get introduced to Rebel Wilson and Alfie Allen's character who really aren't that important to the story, although they are an excellent source of comedy for the movie. Now the kids are told that the boys are going to be learning how to march, shoot guns, blow stuff up, etc. And the girls are going to learn how to make beds, dress wounds, and get pregnant. Which, okay. while hilarious in the film, is very likely the way gender roles were taught to the kids back then. Now we get a little montage of the kids playing board games and doing point. physical activities that Jojo really doesn't seem to be cut out for. During one of the games where there's a small scuffle going on, we see Jojo just trying to avoid getting into any fights. We also see some of the older kids notice Jojo doing this. Now we see the kids in a classroom setting where they're discussing what a Jewish person looks like. While the ridiculousness of this scene is cranked to 11 in this movie, talking about how Jewish people have snakes, the... tongues, devil horns, and scales, there are accounts of German teachers that would bring Jewish kids to the front of the classroom for biology lessons where they would point out racial inferiorities. So this is what I'm talking about with the whole satire bit. Taika Waititi takes real events that happen in history and maxes out the ridiculous meter just to show how stupid and awful it all really was. After that, we see the kids at a book burning. This part was really powerful to me because we see Jojo, who seems almost confused about why he's doing what he's doing, but all the people around him are excited and cheering, so he joins in. 
which is a great way to portray how I'm sure a lot of the people of Germany felt back then. They may not have fully realized what they were doing, but they were being told that they were special and everyone around them was cheering and clapping with the along crowd, I guess. So they just joined in. But in contrast, right behind Jojo, we see Klenzendorf, who does realize what they're doing, but can't really do anything to stop it. And we see no. the complete disgust on his face as he turns to more alcohol, likely to try to block it out. Now we see Jojo laying in his tent, talking to his best friend Yorky, who steals the show every time he's in a scene, by the way, about how if he were to ever catch a Jew, he would kill it and bring it to Hitler so he could become his best friend, even though Yorky thought he was his best friend. Then we would become best friends. I thought I was your best friend. The next day, however, the kids are brought to the woods by the older teenagers. One of the teens tells the kids that they have to be willing to kill to be useful in Hitler's army. And he calls out Jojo, asking him if he's willing to kill. And Jojo tries to act confident by saying, of course, I love killing. So the teens bring out a rabbit and tell Jojo to kill it. He's obviously Not hesitant and nervous, showing us that he's not the person he wants to be. He wants to be a hardcore Nazi that would be so good at killing Jews he would be part of Hitler's personal guard. But at his core, he can't even kill an innocent rabbit. At his core, he's a good person and doesn't want to kill anything. But now the teens tell Jojo that he's a coward just like his father. They start mocking Jojo. They say huh. he's as scared as a little rabbit and they give him the nickname Jojo Rabbit. Jojo runs off into the forest and he gets a visit from Hitler where he asks him what happened. And Jojo says that he just couldn't kill the rabbit. But Hitler tells Jojo that the rabbit is a smart, swift, and cunning animal that Jojo should be proud to be. This gives Jojo the confidence to run back to camp, grab a grenade, and throw it. However, the grenade hits a tree and bounces back to Jojo, blowing him up. We see Jojo rush to the hospital, and we get to see that he has become... God. And mm -hmm. No, but honestly, they make a huge deal that Jojo looks like a disgusting monster when he's just got, you know, a couple of scars across his face. But this is also where we see Jojo's mother, Rosie, for the first time. This character is played by Scarlett Johansson, who I'll just say now does an excellent job. Her acting and portrayal of this character are really what sucked me into this story. But I really love Rosie as a character. She's an amazingly kind-hearted and funny person, and you can easily tell just how deeply she cares for and loves Jojo. She gives Jojo the confidence to go back outside, and she gets him a job at Klinsendorf's office. His job is to go around town delivering people their conscriptions and posting Jesus, propaganda okay. flyers. But this is where we start to see the real darkness that this movie has buried underneath its comical outer layer. As they're walking uh. in the town, we see Rosie looking at a group of people that were publicly hanged. Uh. One man with a tag on him that says, Free Germany, fight the bloody, shows us that these people were likely hanged for treason. Jojo asks his mother what they did, and she just replies, what they could. This shows us that she appreciates what these people did, and she stands behind them. Jojo comes home after work to find that his mother isn't there, and while searching for her, he hears a noise upstairs. He goes into his sister's room and discovers a door that leads to a crawl space within the walls. Inside the crawl space, he finds a girl living there. Elsa is a Jewish girl that's been living inside the walls of Jojo's house for some time. She knows what will happen if anyone finds out she's living there, so she threatens yeah, Jojo. Like she plays into the Jewish stereotypes and misconceptions that Jojo has been taught in order to get him to fear her. She tells him that if he lets anyone know about her, that she'll tell them he and his mother helped her which will get them all killed. So Jojo has a discussion with Hitler about what they should do about her, coming to the conclusion that he should try to negotiate. After this goes awry, we see Rosie coming home. She's obviously trying to sneak into the house without Jojo hearing her, but he was already waiting by the door. We don't know for sure yet, but it's easy enough to assume, since we already know she was supportive of the hanged people, she was likely out doing things in an attempt to sabotage the German war effort. After a conversation with Rosie about hearing noises upstairs, we see him standing outside his mother's bathroom with a fire poker standing guard. This tells me that Jojo really is just a good kid who thinks he's doing the right thing. He's been raised to believe that Jews are evil oh, no. and harmful, so he's just trying to protect his mother. Next, it cuts to Rosie in the crawl space with Elsa, Can telling her that she can't be forced to choose between her and her son. And she says that Jojo is a fanatic, that it took him three weeks to get over the fact that his grandfather wasn't blonde, but she knows her sweet, innocent little boy is still in there. This is such a tragic situation. Rosie obviously is disgusted by the ideology of the Nazis, but she's forced to allow her only child to be fully indoctrinated into it in order to protect him. Now we see Jojo at a pool designed for rehabilitation, and while Jojo is on a bed for therapy, we get a shot of Rosie's shoes, which which I'm sure is completely irrelevant, so yeah, no need to remember what her shoes look like. I don't even know why I'm mentioning it. Now Jojo goes and talks to Klinsendorf and asks him you know what the shoes would and what he should do if he sees a Jew. Klinsendorf tells him that if he sees a Jew, then he should report it, and they'll kill it, and anyone who helped it, and some other people just for good measure. If you see a Jew, you tell us, we tell the Gestapo, and they tell the SS, and then they go and they kill the Jew. And anyone who helped the Jew. 
And because these are very paranoid times, probably some other people just in case. It's a pretty drawn out process. He asks even if the Jew hypnotized someone to help them, showing us more of his complete naivety. But Klinzendorf gives Jojo the idea to write a book on how to identify a Jew, because without their funny hats it's damn near impossible, which was just hilarious to me. So Jojo goes to Elsa and tells her that he'll only let her stay if she tells him everything about the Jewish race. She tells Jojo that his mother is kind and she treats her like a person, but Jojo tells her that she's not a person, not a proper person. This then sends Jojo into a speech about how he's superior to her because of his ancestors. So Elsa grabs him and tells him if he's so strong, he should be able to break free. She tells him that there are no weak Jews, that they were chosen by God, and his people were chosen by a pathetic man that can't grow a full mustache. This is also on point. I just love it. And it starts to kick off Jojo's realization that he's not special because of his ancestry. There's nothing about his blood that makes him superior to anyone else. Now Jojo and his mother are having dinner, and Rosie seems to be happy about something. She tells Jojo that the war is coming to an end, as Germany is being defeated. This enrages Jojo and he tells her that Germany is still going to win the war. Jojo then says that he doesn't want the food to go to waste and begins eating the extra food. This is because he knows that the extra food is going to Elsa. We start to see tensions rise between okay. Jojo and his mother in this scene. It comes to a point where Jojo says that. that he wishes his dad were here because he would understand. So Rosie grabs his coat, puts some charcoal on her face, and pretends to be his dad and yells at Jojo. This scene hits me hard. Rosie is an incredible mother. Yeah. It's so obvious how much she loves and cares for Jojo, but it's not in some overt this scene is kind of heartbreaking in so many movies. She jokes with Jojo, she argues with him, but she always lets him know just how much she cares. Now we get another interaction between Jojo and Elsa, where we find out about Nathan, Elsa's fiancé. But this conversation is far more civil. We see that they're beginning to actually open up a little bit to each other, and it's quite lovely. Now he decides to forge a letter from Nathan, a letter where Nathan breaks up with Elsa. Elsa gets broken up over this, she runs and hides in her crawl space. But I love this scene, because Jojo is obviously upset about the fact that he hurt Elsa. He goes goes and forges a second letter, talking about how Nathan doesn't actually want to break up with her. This is where we really start to see Jojo's worldview mm. shift. Mm. If he was, he wanted connect, to be huh? at the start, he wouldn't have cared at all about hurting her, because she wouldn't even be a person to him. But that's not Jojo. He understands she's a person with feelings, just like him. We then see Jojo and Rosie taking a walk outside. They talk a little bit about love and romance, but during this conversation, Rosie tells Jojo that life is a gift, and that we need to show that's God that we're grateful to be alive. And then we get another shot of her shoes as she's dancing. I really don't know why they keep having shots of her shoes, okay. but, you know, whatever, just disregard them. Like I said, they're really not important. Jojo goes mm. back to the office and asks Klinzendorf about Jews. Klinzendorf says he has no time as he's trying to plan a defense of the city, telling us there will be an invasion soon. But he tells Klinzendorf about his book that he's writing, and Klinzendorf laughs at it. But he shows Jojo the uniform he's been working on, which gets me every time. The feathers for aerodynamics, the sparkly color, oh, no. those are the enemy that Boots, truly decorative. It really this, in the last this is a Gatling gun mounted with a radio, which emits annoying music to this hardly enemy. But after that, he gets more serious with Jojo. He asks him how it's going being the man of the house. We know Klinzendorf is friends with Rosie, so it's not too much to assume that he is at least sympathetic to the same cause as her. Jojo gets a new job, walking around town collecting metal for the war effort, and he sees his mom drop a note onto the bench outside. A note that says the same thing that was stuck to the hanging man we saw earlier. We know Jojo was already suspicious of his mother's loyalty to Germany, but now he knows it's true. His mother has been fighting against the party. The amount of cognitive dissonance Jojo must be feeling at this point in the movie is insane. This is something he's been a part of practically his whole life. This ideology was a core part of his being for a long time. And for him to find out that his own mother is risking her life in order to bring it down must really make him think that maybe he's been on the wrong side all along. It's tough to get into the head of a 10 year old, but they do yeah, a very good job showing the distress this causes him. Jojo is now back home, and we see him give some colored pencils to Elsa. He tries to act like it's nothing. Hoping to believe he still doesn't care about a Jew. But it's easy to tell that underneath he knows he's being kind and it's simply because he cares for her. They talk about how he's crippled and Jojo complains that he'll never be kissed by a girl. So Elsa offers to kiss him. He tells her that it's illegal for Nazis and Jews to hang out, let alone kiss. But can, Elsa yeah. tells him that he's not a Nazi. She knows that Jojo cares for her and that's something a Nazi couldn't do. She tells him that he's just a kid that wants to be a part of a club, which is an excellent way to portray what I'm sure it was like for plenty of kids growing up under the Nazi regime. He's just a 10 year old boy who's told again and again by all the adults around him that the ideologies of the Nazi party are his one true path. 
America. Greatness. He sees all the kids around him joining the Hitler Youth and being excited about everything they're told. It's impossible to blame any kid for falling into this trap, and it's the same trap that Jojo fell into. At his core, he's really just a kind kid who cares for other people, but these evil adults have dressed him up in a uniform, covered him in swastikas, and manipulated him into becoming just like them. But that's not who Jojo is. And all it really takes at the end of the day is exposure to a different way of thinking to make him realize this. Through his life, he's really only been shown one thing, the Nazi ideology. But through exposure to Elsa and realizing what the ideology truly means beneath all the propaganda, it enables him to understand what's really going on. After their talk, we see Jojo and Elsa just hanging around the house as if they're really just friends now. But there's a knock at the door, and it's uh -oh. the Gestapo. Jojo lets them into the house and they immediately begin tearing things apart as if they're looking for something. The tension really starts starts to mount as we know Elsa is hiding upstairs and it could only be a matter of time before they find her. Steven Merchant is the main Gestapo officer and damn if he's not a scary looking dude. However we see Klenzendorf and Finkel come into the house and they say they were there to drop off some Actually pamphlets for Jojo by to this hand guy. out. Now while the Gestapo are searching the house, the main officer asks Jojo where his DJ knife is and Elsa calls out saying that she has it. I think it makes sense that she would come out of her hiding place and present herself as Jojo's sister because if she had just been found in the crawl space, it would have been no question who she Really was. It also serves to ramp up the tension, as we know that one misstep would mean she was dead. This is made even worse when she's forced to give everyone in the room a Heil Hitler. She has to give praise to the man who is responsible for the loss of every single thing in her life, and she has to do it eight times. He then asks Elsa if he can see the papers. This part had me on the edge of my seat, because we know that the Nazi intolerance for Jews is so high that if she messes up the slightest bit, then she'll be killed. After she grabs the papers, Klenzendorf asks for them, and he begins to read them. He asks for a date of birth and she tells him the first of May 1929. Klinsendorf then looks at her and tells her that she's correct. However, the officer shouts and Klinsendorf hands the papers over to him, which now that I'm rewatching it makes me realize just how intense that must have been for Klinsendorf. Okay. Because a few moments later we find out that Elsa was wrong about Inga's birthday and that Klinsendorf had helped her, so he would have absolutely been dead too. However, the officer walks past Klinsendorf to find Jojo's book. As they're leaving, Klinsendorf tells Jojo to stay home, look after his family and his knife. We now see Klinsendorf for what he truly is. He's a lot like Jojo. He's a man who is good at the core, but he's trapped under this regime. We now see Jojo at the dinner table, where he's having another conversation with Hitler, and we really get to see him as an amalgamation of Jojo's inner conflict. Obviously, this is all in his head, so when we hear Hitler questioning Jojo's loyalty, that's him questioning his own loyalty. He tells Hitler that Elsa isn't a bad person, and Hitler delves into a speech to try to remind Jojo of where his real loyalties are supposed to lie. Now we see Jojo walking around the town when he sees a butter fly. He begins walking after it and eventually uh -oh. flies off. Jojo stands up and the camera pans with him this to see Rosie's shoes hanging right next to him. Damn. I can't tell you how hard this hit me the first time I watched it. These are the same shoes we've seen in previous scenes, and every time we've seen them, they've been dancing, full of life and wondrous joy. Oh, now they hang there, lifeless, all for Jojo to witness. Jojo knows his mother was a good person. He knows he was always trying to do the right thing. And now the full consequences of that are shown to Jojo, because those traits were only ever rewarded with death in the Nazi regime, and that's what Jojo supported. He supported the regime that got his own mother killed, and seeing the weight of that on a 10-year-old boy is truly something else. It would be hard to watch anyone go through something like this, but to see it happen to a child, it's painful. There's I beauty in this, though. Though. This movie so keeps you distracted. Him. It shows the Nazis as dumb and cartoony all for the laughs, but then it full frontal assaults you with just how disgusting and painful this time really was for people. And as hard as it is to watch, I commend this movie for it. Roman Griffin Davis's acting in this scene is also nothing short of phenomenal. The way he breaks down and hugs her, then trying and failing to tie her shoes, it's unbelievably heart-wrenching to watch. Watch. After this, Jojo goes back home, knife in hand, and stabs Elsa in the shoulder. I was confused by this at first. Why stab her? But watching yeah. it again, I realized that he's a confused kid. He just saw his own mother hanging from the gallows. He's outraged and needs to take it out on something, and he could have rationalized that maybe it was Elsa's fault that she's dead. She is the Jew Rosie's been keeping in the walls, after all. But right after he stabs her, he turns around and collapses. Because he doesn't hate her, he knows it's not her fault. He's just completely devastated. Now we see them watching an air raid from afar. And Elsa tells Jojo that Rosie loved him, and all she ever wanted to do was protect him. And that's why she allowed him to become a Nazi. And Elsa tells him how her parents were taken to the train station, one you don't come back from, obviously implying that they were taken to a concentration camp and are most likely dead by now. In the next scene, we see Jojo walking 
passing through the city. We can see the destruction caused by the air raids, <gülüyor> and then we see him scrounging <gülüyor> through the garbage <gülüyor> to find things to eat. I just can't imagine <gülüyor> what it must have felt like for the children that were actually going through this. That's why I'm glad movies like this exist. It can really help give you insight into what other people's lives were like. And I really don't think this movie is that far off from reality in terms of the conditions that Nazi Germany was in towards the end of the war. Now Jojo is out in the city looking for food right at the start of the invasion. And this is where we see an intense clash of tones. There are funny jokes mixed in with terrifying war scenes. Now this is pretty subjective as I can't really tell you what you're going to find funny. So if the jokes don't land for you, well, they don't land for you. But personally, I find it really well done. Because to me, at least, it seems like this is exactly exactly what the movie has all been about. It makes us laugh in a historical period that should be looked at with disgust and horror, but I really think the purpose was to make you feel uncomfortable. After the battle ends though, we see Jojo walking around, and we see that the allies have won. However, an allied soldier spots Jojo's uniform, and they send him to where the other prisoners are. This is where he finds Klunzendorf, who's also been captured. He tells him that it's all come to an end, and that the party's over. He tells Jojo that his mother was a good person, an actual good person. Then he does one last good deed. He rips off Jojo's jacket and yells get away from me Jew and spits on Jojo. So a soldier picks up Jojo and takes him away from the prisoners as Klinsendorf gets carried away. And after he's taken away all we hear are gunshots going off and we get Jojo's reaction. Oh boy this movie really knows how to punch you in the gut. Klinsendorf really was just a good person who was unfortunately placed on the wrong side by fate. It's obvious he wasn't really supportive of the Nazi party and he really did like Rosie. And the last thing he ever does is tell Jojo to look after Elsa and then saves his life. It's beautiful, really. But right after this, Jojo finds Yorkie, and Yorkie says exactly what we're all thinking after watching this movie. I'm gonna go home and see my mother. I need to cover him. But he also says that now that the war is over, Elsa can finally be free, and she can finally leave. So Jojo runs home to find her and tell her what happened, but he lies to her. He tells her that Germany won the war, and it's because he just doesn't want Elsa to leave. She's the only person he really has left in his life, and if she leaves, he'll truly be alone. But he realizes that he won't be able to lie to her forever, so he goes back and fakes another letter from Nathan. Jojo tells her that he and Nathan have devised a plan for her to escape, and that they can live together in Paris, and for her to not worry about Jojo. This is where we get to see great character growth out of him. He went from wanting Elsa dead to becoming her friend to being plan. able to set her free because he knows it's what's best for her, even if that means being left utterly alone. But after telling her all this, Elsa tells him that Nathan had died last year from tuberculosis, letting Jojo know that she's known the whole time that he'd been faking these letters. So Jojo tells her that he loves her, even though she thinks of him as a younger brother, and he tells her that he really has found a way for her to escape. But when he's getting ready to leave, he gets another visit from Hitler, who now was a bullet the hole in the side of his head. One. Hitler tells him that he needs to get rid of the Jew girl and come back to where he belongs. But Jojo I says, know, and kicks him out the window. A physical representation of his rejection of the Nazi party. Okay. So now Jojo takes Elsa outside where she sees the American flag being flown. Now Elsa finally gets to feel freedom after years of hiding. And the first thing she does is exactly what she said she would do. She dances. Just like how Rosie said that you dance to be free. Mm. Now that Elsa's free, she can dance. Yeah, it's it's to imagine what it must be like not being able to go outside for years bowling. being stuck in a dark crawl space for years and then finally walking outside to the side of true freedom it's an incredible thing honestly but now the movie has come to an end my goodness i love this movie there are so many things i can praise this movie for so i'm going to start with my favorite part the characters all of the characters in this movie are just so compelling which is incredible once you realize that the only character that actually goes through any growth is jojo but elsa has such a tragic story that it makes you feel like she just needs to escape. If she could just get away from this awful regime, then everything would be okay. Slowly seeing Klinsendorf's true colors is incredible to me, but the character that made me fall in love with this movie was Rosie. Her undying love and care for Jojo was so obvious, but written in such a natural way. She wasn't constantly telling Jojo that she loved him, and we saw it from the way she interacted with him, the way she joked and lovingly insulted him, but still took care of him and cheered him up when he needed it. It was all just so beautifully written. Now, speaking of writing, the writing was great. I think there are a few minor dings I could give it. Like the fact that Klinsendorf kind of just keeps showing up wherever he's needed for the plot. Mm. I mean, they always give an explanation for why he's there. It generally just comes off as contrived most of the time. But with that said, it's not like the script yeah, exactly. contains any major time. plot holes or contrivances. There's no point where the movie falls apart, as they say. So I guess it's another point of Cinema Wins being wrong about that. Go watch my Truman Show video if you don't understand what I'm referencing. I'm really not much of a cinematography mm. guy. I just don't know that much about it. But there were plenty of shots that I love. 
first and foremost, the foreshadowing of the shoes shots are just an incredible way to get the audience familiar with those shoes just so they can rip your heart out with them later. I will say, however, there seems to be like a, a gray tent over a good chunk of the movie, which I'm sure was intentional for the tone they wanted, but my eyes got kind of tired of the muted colors. Really not a big deal though. I've talked about the acting already, but damn. I can't think of a single actor who didn't do an incredible job. Roman Griffin Davis, of course, did an excellent job, especially for a 12-year-old that is on screen for pretty much the entire movie. It blows me away. Taika Waititi is an excellent Hitler, as yeah, strange as that is to say. I appreciate the fact that it really okay. felt like he was just trying to play a goofy version of Hitler, rather than just using him for shock factors to try to make his jokes funnier. But this brings me to the whole satire bit of the movie. It seems like the satire in this movie was you either Absolutely. enjoy it or you don't. Okay, that Blame sounds like Hitler. a dumb thing to say, but what I mean is, either you can put up with seeing a group of the most deplorable humans in history being shown as goofballs, or you can't. Either way is fine, but I'll say this, there are people out there who don't enjoy subjecting themselves to witnessing atrocities like the Holocaust. Not that they want to hide from the truth, just the fact that having to watch people go through these things can be hard to stomach. Which is fine. I'm not going to tell you how you need to feel when watching that kind of stuff, but movies like this can be important for those people, because it gives them a way to be witness to this kind of content in a way that they can handle. Okay, I guess I've given a number for everything I've done so far, so I'll do it for this one as well. And after everything I've talked about today, I think I'd go with an 8.5 out of 10. It's a beautiful movie that will reel you in with comedy gold and then sucker punch you in the gut as soon as you're not looking. I don't think the script is as tightly written or solid as The Truman Show, and that would be why this movie got a half a point lower of a score. But honestly, if someone would never seen the movie asked me which they should watch, I'd have to go with Jojo Rabbit. I just feel like this movie is far more important for humanity, I guess. And I think that pretty much everyone should see it. But yeah, I think that's all I have to say on Jojo Rabbit for now. Thank you for sticking with me through this whole thing. Okay. If you're this thinking of something I may have missed, don't be afraid to tell me. I'm...